SCP-3890. Forget me not. We've talked about a large number of terrifying and tragic concepts throughout this series, including fears of isolation, mental degradation, and loss of memories. Those three ideas are very real fears in our world, but the SCP universe tends to amplify things by a great degree. It's in SCP-3890 that we'll find all three of those fears, as an individual is stuck in an extra-dimensional location by herself and begins to be affected quite a bit by the ordeal. Unlike most SCP articles, which are compiled by researchers after performing extensive research and testing, SCP-3890 is written as more like a journal by the individual currently experiencing the SCP's effects. Dr. Elizabeth Graham. Elizabeth was transported to this extra-dimensional or extra-terrestrial space that she has designated as 3890, but she doesn't know at all how she got here. She had been carrying documentation pertaining to the containment of several other SCPs at the time, but she doesn't feel that those SCPs are related to this one. Her surroundings consist of a seemingly infinite desert with ruins of differing architectural design poking through the sand, including both modern buildings and ruins of ancient Roman and Arrakeshian structures. For reference, the civilization of Arrakesh were the ones that contained SCP-2317, the Devourer of Worlds. Elizabeth has explored some of these ruins, but found them to be mostly empty. From what she can tell so far, this location goes through a solar cycle identical to Earth's, leading her to wonder if 3890 is perhaps located on Earth, but is simply hidden from outside view through anomalous means. Unlike an actual desert on Earth, the temperatures are never extreme at day or night. She is not quite alone here though as there are a number of humanoid entities that wander the desert and the ruins. These entities haven't responded to any stimuli, and as far as Elizabeth can tell, they simply walk around without a specific destination, some even walking in circles around buildings. They are corporeal, however, and based on their appearances, she figures that they also come from a large range of locations and times both modern and ancient. She also managed to take a knife from the pocket of one of them with no repercussions. It would seem that, although she doesn't state it directly, she eventually attacked one of the entities, which didn't defend itself. She then proceeded to perform a field autopsy on the corpse, as she is a foundation researcher after all, and found that they show no differences between a normal human. This leads her to two potential theories, one being that these entities were created by someone or something to perfectly resemble humans, with their mindless nature being the result of an imperfect creation. The other theory is that these are indeed humans, but have lost their mental faculties for some reason. The final thing she notes for now is that none of the entities here, including herself, seem to experience hunger or thirst, as she's been here for three days and still feels fine. She's not sure if she doesn't actually need food here or if she simply believes she doesn't, but since she hasn't found any food whatsoever so far, she hopes it's the former. In the next log, Elizabeth describes a different type of entity that she has discovered residing in this location one of varying shape and size. She's not sure if it's native to this place or was transported here at some point like her, but it appears to be some form of predator and it's currently hunting her. After writing down the last log, it snuck up behind her while she was resting and attacked her, knocking her unconscious. She woke up several hours later, but it has attacked her several more times since then every few hours. She believes that this entity has the ability to mimic any object, and has seen it disguised as one of the humanoids, as a piece of paper, as a star in the sky, a building on the horizon, a fly, and a patch of dirt on her leg. 
she can't be sure if it's actually morphing its body into these shapes or just tricking her mind into believing that it's changed, but either way, it's pretty disconcerting. Once it reveals itself and attacks, it takes on its true form, in her words, which appears as some sort of black origami constantly folding and unfolding into itself. These attacks are not physical though, but rather mental, as its power seems to be in amnestization. She has so far lost memories of significant chunks of her childhood and early adulthood, no longer able to remember which high school she attended, or what her first job was. She believes that this entity feeds on memory, and that the other humanoids were people who ended up here like her and lost all of their memories. Elizabeth takes up residence in a modern bank, near a family that had committed suicide, a solution that she believes might be a better option than wandering this location for eternity. She's writing down all of her vital memories in case they get erased from her mind, and she is planning on killing anything that enters the building. So far, she's lost all of her memories regarding how she came to be employed at the foundation although she does still remember that she's a researcher with level 3 clearance. She's forgotten many of the anomalies she's worked on though. She had spent some time traveling in one direction in the hope that she could eventually reach the end of this desert, but she's now given up on that hope. The entity continues to attack her, and it's practically impossible to avoid, since it can even masquerade as a grain of sand. She's not surprised that the location is infinite in size, as she does remember several similar anomalies. Even if it weren't quite infinite, she believes she still wouldn't make it to whatever end there is before the entity drained her of her memories. She doesn't believe she'll ever leave now, and she remembers being told horror stories of other researchers ending up in similar situations. These stories were meant as cautionary tales, to warn you of what you shouldn't do in certain scenarios. She figures that she's now a cautionary tale, even if she doesn't know what she did wrong. She's growing more and more paranoid of the entity, constantly examining everything in her surroundings to see if it's actually the creature. She can't remember the last time she let go of her knife, now stained red from testing corpses. Additionally, even though she doesn't eat food or drink, she does need to sleep, which makes it especially easy for the entity to attack her. She ponders if this location is some sort of enclosure set up for the entity's benefit, or some sort of sick game. She writes down her name multiple times to keep a record of it in case she forgets. She also hears something crying outside of the building, which is a new occurrence. The crying turned out to come from a 10 year old child named Tony. According to Tony, he was walking home from the playground when he was transported here, a similar story to Elizabeth's. She wonders if the act of traveling is required for the entity to bring you to this place, in a metaphysical sense, but then says that she doesn't know what she's talking about, or maybe she does but she forgot. Tony is of course traumatized, and they have barely spoken to one another. She almost forgot what it was like to not be alone. She first writes that the entity can now hunt them both, but she scratches that out and instead writes that now they can watch for it together, so their survival chances have doubled. The problem is though that they're not fighting for survival, but instead for their memories. She's not even sure if people age here so some of these wandering humanoids could have been here for centuries or more. She recalls a memory from her childhood that she still retains, of her visiting a woman in a hospital, although she doesn't know who the woman is, possibly her mother or grandmother. She went to visit this woman when she was 12, but the woman didn't know who she was. Elizabeth doesn't remember what happened before that memory or afterwards, but she does remember thinking that it was the worst thing in the world. She wonders if that's why this mimic entity brought her here, because it knows that this would be a fate that she'd fear the most. 
She decides to ask Tony when he wakes up if he has a similar memory, in the hopes of figuring out the rules of this place. Things continue to spiral downward for Elizabeth though, as the next part of the log shows how much she is struggling mentally at this point. She lists the SCP number as simply SCP, and the object class as object class. She mentions her name as Elizabeth Grant at first, instead of Elizabeth Graham, and the rest of the containment procedures are mostly gibberish, relating to a floating grain of sand and a patch of dirt on her brain. She then repeats her name a number of times and writes that the mimic entity can mimic any object. So far, she has seen it disguise her as Dr. Elizabeth Graham and the Foundation. The rest of the log is similarly constructed of nonsensical sentences comprised of words related to her situation. She writes several times that she doesn't know what she's talking about, and it's clear that it's not just an absence of memories affecting her, but a complete breakdown of her mental faculties. In other words, she seems to be slipping closer to becoming like the other humanoid entities she's encountered. In the next log though, she's regained a surprising amount of lucidity. She reveals that when she woke up the next morning, Tony was gone, because he was actually the Mimic in disguise. She also claims that the Mimic wrote the last log, not her, but now she can't even remember her name. She writes that she's underestimated the Mimic, as it's smarter than she thought. Whenever she reads her name on the papers from before, it immediately leaves her head afterwards, much like how anti-memetics work. The last log is written in her handwriting, something else it must be capable of mimicking, and it seems to be getting better at copying her thought processes. Worse, she can't remember how long she's been here now, as she looks at her hands and finds them to be quite old in appearance. She accepts that she's not leaving this place, and wonders why she keeps writing these logs, since chances are no one will ever read them. She's not going to sit around and hope some magic team will pop out of a portal to save her. Instead, she plans on facing the Mimic and killing it. She has her knife, which is the best tool she could hope to find here, and she at least remembers how to use that. In the following log, she lists the SCP's object class as neutralized, and says that it's done, but she won't be leaving this place. Elizabeth walked for miles before the Mimic came for her. It was disguised as a cloud this time, and she turned to see it just as it unfolded to attack. She stabbed it as it lunged, and it squealed in pain. It left trails in the sand that hurt to look at but attacked again and again as she retaliated. She writes that she filled its body with holes, just as it filled her mind with them. It writhed on the ground for several minutes, collapsing in on itself as she continued to stab it. As it finally died, it collapsed into a tiny black ball the size of her thumb. She crushed it beneath her heel. She wishes she would have done that right away, but maybe she had a reason for not doing so that she can't remember now. She feels different after the fight though, as before when the Mimic attacked her it took memories right away, but now it feels like her head is leaking out. Her lucidity starts fading, but she writes that she could kill herself right now with the knife to avoid becoming like the other humanoids wandering this desert. She still holds on to life though and doesn't want to die. Just as she is convincing herself to do it, her mind slips away completely, leaving us with the words, I don't want to disappear. The final log for SCP-3890 is completely blank. SCP-3890 is similar to some other SCPs that deal with isolation and mental breakdown, such as SCP-3001, The Red Reality, but leaves us with absolutely no hope for Elizabeth's recovery. She was taken to this place through no fault or mistake of her own, at a young age, and despite her best efforts and hopes to somehow beat it, she slowly slipped away. 
obviously there are correlations to real world conditions that affect an individual's mental faculties and memories, which Elizabeth herself alluded to being a fear of hers. This lends an additional level of horror to the article, a scenario that many of us might not be able to relate to directly, but can at least appreciate its terrifying nature. There are a lot of unanswered questions left from this one, such as why Elizabeth was drawn in at all, did she really manage to kill the mimic, and how did the foundation get a hold of these documents? Still, it's effective at depicting a tragic and horrific scenario in which the fear isn't necessarily other people forgetting you, but you forgetting yourself.